Okay, so time to go ahead and get started and the obligatory housekeeping notes uh, for the first few minutes, uh, grand rounds. Uh, please complete your surveys. The surveys are important to maintain our CME accreditation and continue to deliver appropriate content to you. Regarding video conferencing and videotaping, these conferences are all videotaped, live streamed on Facebook, live stream and on YouTube. So one of the issues when you watch this remotely, which I've done multiple occasions, is when you have questions from the audience, you can't hear them unless there's a microphone. So uh, if, you, if you can, just hold up your hand, somebody will bring a microphone to you. A uh, video, video of this conference will be available on the DICE at the Debakey Education YouTube channel, usually about a week after the presentation. Last but not least, don't forget about our next conference, uh, Re-Evolution Summit, which is really hands-on, minimally invasive cardiac surgery training that Dr. Ramshadani runs, uh, is on here and next week. Okay, it's the mandatory stuff. Let me know to the fun part. And so, you can see the title. This is one of these titles that 10 years ago, if I'd seen this title at a yawn, turned over, probably gone back to sleep. However, this is the world that we live in at the moment, and it's going to be increasingly important to how we function in the hospital. We're all judged on this really on a daily basis in terms of patient satisfaction and increasingly this is going to be tied to hospital reimbursement as we move forward. So nothing like that to help refocus the clinician on uh, the, the topic you're going to hear about today. So let me introduce you know, our speaker and our speaker today is Dr. Bita Cash. She's a PhD, MBA, FACHE and let me tell you what that is. She's the director for the Center of Outcomes Research. This is a relatively new concept here, and she's been here at Methodist with a joint appointment with A&M uh, for just uh, under a year. So she's an associate professor at Texas A&M in the Department of Health Policy and Management and a joint associate professor at the College of Medicine's Department of Internal Medicine. Dr. Cash received a Master's of Business Administration from the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina and completed a two-year administrative fellowship at MUSC and later worked as a management consultant with RSM McGladry Inc. before receiving a PhD in health services research from Texas A&M in 2007. So they're very different uh, from the usual speakers that we hear. Dr. Cash joined the Center for Outcomes Research at Houston Methodist in April 2017 but she's also the director of an eight university NSF National Science Foundation industry slash university cooperative research center, which is anchored at A&M and partners with over 30 industry members to conduct collaborative research towards innovation in healthcare delivery. As director and lead researcher at the NSF Center for Health Organization and Transformation, Dr. Cash conducts research to support the implementation of evidence-based transformational strategies within healthcare organizations. Her research model relies on the knowledge and experience of healthcare leaders to guide academic research. And her cooperative and multidisciplinary research model has resulted in over $4 million in external research funding from NSF, industry, and other sources. And she's also a fellow of the American College of Healthcare Executives and received ACHE Service Award in 2015. Congratulations. So, not just your average person who's a real true expert in some of the fundamentals of what we're going to be working with here at Mathis over the next five years. She's a tremendous um, addition to the faculty here. And she was very kind because we had an empty slot. I heard her speak at one of the internal meetings and thought, we really need to get a piece of this action in the cardiovascular world. And so this is an opportunity to introduce Dr. Cash and the resources and her expertise to the Heart and Vascular Center. And hopefully people will reach out to you afterwards to see what we can do together. Thank you very much for uh, taking the slot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lumsden. Now, this was one of the most detailed introductions uh, I've, I've ever had, so uh, nice to be here. Howdy. Uh, thank you for coming this morning, and as Dr. Lumsden was saying, this is a bit different of a topic uh, that we'll be covering here. I'll do my best to uh, cover some of the work we have done on readmissions, mostly at the beginning, after I introduce Ethan comes research and the type of research we, we do because I think um, just understanding what outcomes researchers, health, health services researchers do uh, helps this collaborative culture. Um, I will go through that qu quite quickly. I'll spend most of the time on uh, readmission strategies that we have identified as uh, evidence-based in helping us uh, in reducing readmissions. Uh, from studies here at Texas Medical Center as well as, well as uh, in Pennsylvania. 
Uh, and then if we have time, I would like to uh, share some theory building activity we have had in uh, uh, developing the new framework for patient experience, uh, which you will see it's, there is a lot of opportunity to uh, develop new theory when it comes to how do we organize healthcare. Uh, so let's get started how we fit in uh, to the RI uh, strategic plan. Uh, we we uh, fill that outcomes research uh, piece uh, of the star. So uh, we're, we're very happy to be able to do that uh, here at, uh, with Methodists as our collaborators. The way we have set up the center, and we just went through a, a strategic planning um, process, and uh, it, it helps that uh, I am a strategist by training. So, so health services researcher and strategist uh, had to come up with a strategic plan. Uh, they judge you, right, if you don't at, and, uh, come up with a strategic plan. So this is at, for outcomes research. It is a joint center with Texas A&M, so we do leverage uh, the resources and the faculty and the expertise that we can uh, reach out to at Texas A&M. And what we, we do is design, test, validate, implement innovations in healthcare delivery. Uh, so that we can uh, get a better insight of what works, what doesn't work. So that, uh, the way we uh, describe ourselves is leading health outcomes by design. This is our organizational chart. I report up to Dr. Phillips on the health system side as well as uh, Mauro Ferrari on the RI side. Uh, and our stakeholder committee is a combination of uh, the chairs here, uh, the department chairs, as well as the dean of the School of Public Health uh, at Texas A&M, and we work very closely with uh, School of Engineering at Te Texas A&M as well. This is our, uh, what we do in terms of a logic model. Uh, I would call everything that goes into our production line inputs uh, would be team, teams of researchers, multidisciplinary researchers, uh, in order to uh, produce knowledge, again, test and validate, implement, understand uh, implementation success. Uh, our research cores are population health, quality and safety, workforce training, patient experience, and access to care. So any of these topics uh, seem to be interesting to you. Uh, that's one area to come talk to us. Here is uh, why we are in business at, at, as health services researchers. Uh, a recent uh, meta-analysis of the relative contribution of of several determinants of health outcomes uh, shows you that about if you combine medical care and genetics, health outcomes are associated with those type of activities that you do every day uh, that, that we can't do at all, um, about, at, about 50%. 50% of outcomes are related to the great work that uh, uh, medical care and genetics uh, type research produces. But the other 50% have to do with behaviors, social circumstances, and the environment. And mostly what we're interested in is social circumstances and the environment, both the built environment and, the, and, and where you live, the neighborhoods and the communities. This is an example of just to show you how we're different from the old or traditional uh, linear model of research. Uh, we're used to starting out with uh, basic research, applied research is next, we do clinical trials, we develop something, and then we go into production and implementation. So that's, I, I describe that old traditional model as the traditional skier. And, and most of us uh, understand I'm a skier, uh, we don't like snowboarders. Well, that's where we come in. So we, we like to snowboard. It's a new reverse model. Things have been already implemented. People now have business questions about how did implementation go or should we have or should we keep all five things we're doing or cut it down to three things. Uh, now we come in and reverse research and possibly even inform basic research at, uh, at the end. So in order to do that, this type of mission-driven research uh, we, we get there, we're snowboarders, we get down to the bottom of the hill, but we will disturb a lot of things and there, it, it, a lot of tricks are necessary to get down there. So um, team research is important. So the teams we put together here uh, are research, uh, health services research methodology experts, 
Uh, we have the medicine science uh, uh, expert on the team, as well as engineering and design. So the team comes together to uh, really solve practical solutions. And at the end, the outcome needs to be the triple aim. Somehow we need to show that we, we have been able to improve health for populations or better care, uh, higher quality of care, uh, as well as lower cost. So, so far, when you look at the history of what health services research has done so far in terms of just metrics, um, the foundation of uh, health services research is, is based on the Donabedian model in the late 80s. Uh, and uh, it's, it's clear, it's, it's structure, uh, the physical and organizational characteristics that produce certain processes, uh, which is basically care delivered, the process of care, uh, which then produces certain outcomes. And when you look at uh, what has been done in terms of um, developing standardized outcome measures, most of those outcome measures are process and uh, outcome measures. Uh, we're very much under construction when it comes to understanding and how do we measure structure. And, and really what we're interested in, where we think we can add to, the, uh, in a, to in both innovation and new knowledge is uh, to better understand how we develop these, uh, how do we organize care that produces these processes that we measure, you know, most of these measures with processes are, are, are uh, has, have things been done, check, checklists. Uh, so th those measures are, are, there are quite a bit of those. Uh, and there is plenty of um, outcomes that we, that we measure that have to do uh, re with readmissions or mortality. But how do we organize in order to produce those? Those are the type of structural uh, questions that we have. And, and that's what we're mostly focused on. Some examples of collaborations with CORE right now, uh, we're interested in starting with pilot projects internally, but eventually we're very much interested in also uh, collaborating with our physician scientists on uh, applying for um, multidisciplinary type outcomes uh, grants. So right now we started out with uh, Transitions Explored and Studied, the Texas project, which you will see uh, some results today. Uh, we are uh, moving forward with an NSF uh, grant challenge grant focused on uh, access to appropriate cancer care for all Americans. So um, it, it's access of care focused. Uh, we are building on what's already been done here in terms of workforce training for early sepsis recognition. So uh, we have had two R18s uh, already submitted uh, within this last year, and then uh, one R21 uh, application that went out uh, in collaboration with Cyborg and our surgery team. So let's go ahead and uh, start with some results of the Texas project. Uh, and at any point, please uh, interrupt and ask any questions. I will cover results uh, specific to uh, specific AIM 1, 2, and 3, uh, but it took uh, quite a team to do this. Uh, so I will be uh, recognizing them as well. So mostly the Texas A&M team was uh, responsible for AIM-1, and we have already published some pa papers coming out of AIM-1, which was uh, we need to know uh, an inventory of strategies that reduce readmissions. How do we categorize them and which ones really work? Right? And then identify which ones are TMC members actually using. Are they using evidence-based practices? Aim two was let's pick two out of those uh, uh, intervention strategies and see how much do they cost the system. So it was time-dependent activity costing uh, in terms of what does it cost us to do this and does it make sense? And then aim three had to do with we're using some risk scoring in order to identify populations uh, of high risk of readmissions. How do those typical risk scores perform? So that was uh, AIM-3. The team uh, was composed of uh, Houston Methodist investigators, mostly Dr. Jones, uh, the uh, PI on the whole project with the, that was Dr. Phillips. We had collaborators at MD Anderson, mostly focused on AIM-2. Dr. Feely and Dr. Manzano, who was, uh, who was involved with all AIMs, uh, really, uh, then we had myself at Texas A&M, 
uh, Baylor College of Medicine with doc Dr. Coleman. We brought in UT as well for, for some uh, publications, and we used Health Connect data as well. So these are the other members of, of the project. So let's go to AIM-1 results. AIM-1 was, results was based on a meta-analysis. So uh, this is basically the methods. Uh, systematic review, uh, we ended up from five uh, over close to 6,000 articles. Uh, we were able to uh, just include uh, 160 uh, to show us how do we categorize evidence-based uh, practices to reduce, uh, uh, reduce readmissions. So, we ended up with a classification of, not, uh, of 12 uh, interventions. So they're, uh, they're classified as 12. You see those on the x-axis. And then the bars are how many times that intervention, that classification of intervention, has been studied. Uh, so collaboration is number one. Collaboration is broad. Now you will see this, it's very messy. So everything that went into collaboration, now we need to do further future studies and understand what type of collaboration works. So we have collaboration, home visits, uh, telephone follow-ups, which is clearer or um, concise, education, patient education, medication reconciliation, discharge planning, follow-up appointments, telemonitoring, guideline implementation, those are clinical pathways, guidelines that are implemented into the system, uh, rehabilitation, clinical medical devices, and an in-hospital management unit. So those are the 12 we really uh, looked at uh, in detail. This is an example where we're really un wanting to understand how do people operationalize these evidence-based uh, interventions. So it looks like to make things even more complicated, most people who use these do these in bundles. So it's very hard to pick one and really be able to study it retrospectively. Uh, most of them uh, are team-based, about, but it's, it was about 50-50. About uh, and we were interested in the use of the health information exchange since it's a, a community good and, and uh, we, we're part of it. Uh, and we saw that not many people used uh, the health information exchange. Uh, it was split between pre-discharge and post-discharge. Many of them are uh, inpatient strategies while inpatient in the setting, uh, but also community and home settings. And then you can see that most of the interventions are focused on uh, heart and lung uh, type diseases. So we, we now look at the top six evidence-based strategies from the literature review, which you see on the right-hand side and want to see if uh, TMC members are following evidence-based practices. And the answer is yes. It looks like the top six are collaboration, education, telephone follow-ups, medication intervention, follow-up appointments, and discharge planning. And uh, most, uh, it looks like Houston Methodist is doing a great job in really following, or is reporting following these evidence-based uh, strategies. <laughs> But then also we wanted to see how do we compare in operationalizing uh, these. So based on uh, the systematic review, it uh, looks like 72% of these are in bundles, very similar to uh, what we saw at Houston Methodist and MD Anderson um, in terms of uh, comparison across uh, the evidence shown in the literature versus uh, the um, participants. Clearly understanding MD Anderson as a different population uh, base. So the conclusion out of this was to really uh, move forward and uh, inform AIM, the AIM2 team. And uh, in order to do uh, time-dependent activity costing, it's important to pick one that's going to be easier to, to uh, uh, cost. Uh, and track. So uh, we went ahead with uh, choosing telephone follow-ups and medication reconciliation, stayed away from collaboration because we thought collaboration is going to be, we're going to be busy understanding collaborations for the next five years. So to aim to, we looked at uh, time-driven activity-based costing. So what, what we did with that is we had MD Anderson and Houston Methodist as our lab. And so we identified the process steps uh, taken to, to, to do that telephone follow-up. We determined the resources that go into each step of this process. Most of those are clearly human resources as the person who makes the phone call. Uh, we determined the time spent 
on that activity for each resource type, and then you determine the probability of the step occurring, and you calculate the resource. So this is what we get. Um, so we chose the um, orthopedic um, patients uh, for Houston Methodist and one of the units at MD Anderson, and, and it, it looks like uh, it's costing uh, us a little bit more. Uh, that's just based on the type of um, staff we use, uh, but overall between uh, about 20 to $30 per uh, phone call, per, uh, discharge phone call, which is quite effective in reducing um, readmission rates. So uh, moving forward then, we thought, okay, so it's good to know when you're an executive uh, or uh, a, a decision maker that telephone phone, phone cars, calls seem to be pretty cheap, but how effective are they? Right, so relative to other um, uh, strategies. So in this next uh, step, which, uh, which uh, and, and this, this one actually is on uh, health, I, I, I went to the other one, so let's move with this, otherwise I'll switch slides around and I'll make everybody dizzy. Uh, but I'll show you later how we un, uh, took um, these evidence-based uh, strategies and, and understood the relative impact in order to actually come up with a, with, with a uh, good strategy, sustainable strategy to move forward to. This one has to do, this is a paper we uh, published and we're trying to make a lot of noise about, uh, which has to do uh, with, uh, we have invested so many resources in, in, in health information exchange. The US government has done that. Um, through the High Tech uh, Act, and then uh, encouraged uh, hospitals and health systems to participate and, and make this a sustainable model of a uh, community-based health information system with, with that uh, trust in that system. So uh, what we have seen is uh, participating in the health information system or making that as part of your uh, readmission reduction strategies actually works, but not many people do that. So really, that was the message of, of uh, this uh, publication. Uh, we, again, looked at, uh, we chose the same 12 categories that were identified. Uh, and then we look at what type of hospitals are using uh, the health information exchange. Uh, surprisingly, non-academic healthcare centers seem to be using the health information exchange more often than academic health centers. Uh, we are looking at the types of interventions, and you can see that uh, the health information exchange is quite a bit used when you're doing telemonitoring, uh, with telephone follow-ups, and with collaboration. Um, and we looked at the disease types, and it seems to, again, health information exchanges have been used, uh, the ones who reported for heart disease and lung disease quite a bit also in obesity and diabetes management. So really the results show us that uh, successful readmission reduction pro programs utilizing HIEs, and we give, them a, give you a profile of what these programs look like. Uh, unfortunately, non-academic health centers seem to be using them more. So it looks like academic health centers depend on their enterprise uh, health information exchange more than the community health information exchange. And so there is opportunity to really uh, use the health information exchange uh, in the future to reduce readmissions. And that's the, really the, the message out of this, out of this uh, research and this paper. So this is what I wanted to um, show you next. When, when after we figured out what a telephone fo phone call uh, cost us, we needed some kind of an equation, an ROI in equation saying, okay, so should we really do mostly focus on telephone uh, follow-ups? There are so many other cool tools and vendors uh, who will uh, tell us uh, to use uh, technology to reduce readmissions, right? And it looks like we can just simply go back to the phone. So to me, that was uh, quite an interesting finding, but I need to know what's the ROI on that. So. What we here did here is uh, we wanted to understand uh, the relative uh, impact of uh, readmission strategies on uh, uh, 
on reducing readmissions. So this is a paper under review right now, second submission. Again, objective to identify interventions reported as most effective to reducing unplanned 30-day readmissions. Um, and uh, in doing that, what we ended up doing with the meta-analysis is use three measures of relative impact. So again, the t you see the 12 categories of interventions on the right-hand side. Uh, you see the, how many times it was studies studied. We took into um, account the population they studied uh, uh, this uh, uh, each intervention on, and we come up with three measures: the mean percent change of 30-day unplanned readmissions, the weighted mean percent change in readmissions, and then the pool estimated impact level. Uh, when we took the last two ones, um, uh, we, we see uh, quite consistent results. I'll present to you just the weighted by sample size, and this is how we present the results. By each intervention, um, in terms of reported studies, how many studies report low level of readmission reductions, which is we, we coded as uh, 0 to 33% in readmission reduction. Medium would be 34% to 66% readmission reduction. And high levels would be 67% or more. And when you look at this, this here, you really want to see the one with the uh, 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 longest green bar and telephone uh, follow-up, uh, discharge planning, uh, seem to be uh, quite effective, and so that that uh, makes us feel feel great, and uh, we can actually provide some um, guidance to healthcare pra practitioners and and policy uh, what the most uh, effective strategies are in terms of impact size, and so uh, collaboration with with clinical teams and and community. Uh, providers, again, vague, something we will continue studying, uh, but post-discharge uh, home visits, telephone follow-up calls, uh, patient education, and discharge planning were the top six that we're reporting uh, here. So take a look. A telephone phone call will most likely reduce readmissions uh, at about 37%. Um, and it costs you $25, and a readmission costs you $13,000. So it makes, I think, it's quite a cheap way of, of reducing readmissions. AIM-3 results had to do with risk scoring comparisons. Uh, you're uh, probably familiar with risk scores that you use. We chose the top two to compare. It was LACE and hospital. Uh, this group. Um, with this uh, uh, aim, we had uh, Dr. Gravis's group here uh, help us with the analysis, uh, and then uh, we also use Health Connect data uh, in addition to Visient uh, data. We again uh, have uh, MD Anderson and Houston Methodist here participating. Uh, I'm sure um, you know your readmission rates. Uh, readmission rates were 15% uh, here, the 30-day readmission. Uh, rates about 22% at MD Anderson. But overall, in terms of uh, the population, uh, we were quite similar. Although MD Anderson encounters uh, mostly chemotherapy admissions, while we have a broader set of uh, diagnosis here, um, and, and patients here were mo more often female and white, while in MD Anderson, patients tended to be more uh, male and white. But really what we were caring about, encounters were quite similar uh, in terms of the type uh, studied here. So we were comfortable with this uh, uh, combined sample. So we, uh, as you can see, length of stay is very similar. Mean age uh, of admission is quite similar. So what, ha what really matters in terms of a readmission study. And then we were interested in any um, uh, geographic patterns, GIS type study of uh, no admission versus uh, readmission. The red uh, is a readmission and no admission is, is the gray. And there seem, they seem to be um, quite equally distributed. And these are uh, where patients came from. Right? These are where patients came from, 
uh, to come to MD Anderson and, and, uh, and uh, Houston Methodist. And it seems like admissions versus no admissions are geographically uh, widespread uh, and uh, uh, not much uh, variation there. So here's the two um, risk scoring models. LACE uses five criteria, uh, while hospital, the hospital score uses seven criteria. Uh, quite similar still because you have a length of stay in both. Admission type is still uh, discovered in both. There is uh, clearly a um, comorbidity uh, score as well, but uh, maybe hospital looking at things a little bit more in detail. So we want to see how do they perform. Uh, and here is the readmissions uh, by risk group using the two different risk scores. So on the right you have LACE and you have percent um, uh, uh, patients readmitted, 30-day uh, readmissions, uh, and you can see uh, the results for MD Anderson, Houston, Houston Methodist, and both. And so uh, patients with a, a high risk score for LACE were readmitted at about 25%, while patients with low LACE risk score were not very much readmitted. So it did a really nice job there. Uh, with with hospital, you see uh, patients readmitted um, at high risk at about 30% at, at Houston Methodist, but even if they were low risk, about 77% readmission. Here's the prediction, the, the uh, model that we used, which was a logistic uh, uh, model predicting uh, readmission, and we looked at the performance, how uh, LACE performs compared to hospital, again, for both facilities, and then specific to MD Anderson uh, and Houston Methodist. Uh, so, so you can see that um, the odds of um, being readmitted if you were a uh, increased uh, LACE score patient, uh, increased your uh, readmissions at both facilities uh, by uh, 27%, with hospital at about 37%. So a little bit of different prediction there. Um, they were uh, also significantly different. The big score is uh, model fit, so a lower number is, 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 uh, is better. So you can see there is some variation between the hospitals in which one I would pick because uh, it's a better model fit uh, at Houston Methodist to use hospital versus it's a better model fit for MD Anderson to use LACE. Uh, and then what we're interested in is the area under the curve, which is uh, showing you how, uh, how great we do in, in predicting an actual readmission. And so with that uh, a area under the curve uh, column, what you're looking at is a higher number shows you that's a better prediction model. So this is what we uh, uh, have with the area under the curve, which was also significant differences. It looks like overall, um, LACE is doing a better job predicting uh, the uh, readmission than uh, the hospital. Now, this is where it becomes interesting. Look at, uh, look at heart failure patients only. This is, again, both facilities. 30-day uh, unplanned readmissions, and we tried to look at both as well, all-cause readmissions. And uh, what you see here is uh, quite a different story. Uh, you see that the area under the curve uh, for hospital seems to be higher, so it's a better tool to use for uh, heart failure patients. Um, and uh, and you, you also see... Um, that the odd ra odds ratios have quite uh, changed uh, as well. So, so when it comes to heart failure patients, it looks like uh, the hospital score is a better uh, risk calculator versus uh, the lay score. Also, what, the, what, what this kind of gives us is, not, it's, uh, yeah, it's important to look at patient segments, but it also it's important to, to look at uh, uh, different hospital systems. So it's, it's hard to just... Um, make conclusions about ev everyone uh, using the same methodology. So uh, to continue on with readmissions, 
we, we had a project with the with the other center I'm I'm part of, uh, and our one of our industry members uh, is Mainline Health. So that's a large system in uh, Pennsylvania, um, somewhat uh, similar in terms of uh, our patient makeup. Uh, a lot of heart patients, um, and uh, the, their their question was since they're uh, affiliated um, and Dr. David Nash from uh, the uh, Jefferson School of Population Health sits on their board. Uh, guess what they were most interested in? Disparities, right? So, so uh, we wanted to, to show that a disparity score should be included in CMS's um, readmission uh, uh, penalties. So CMS right now doesn't use, as you know, a disparity score. Uh, it's considering to use uh, the uh, a disparity scored, um, uh, but but not at, at this time. So what we were trying to do is show that readmission prediction models are missing that score. And the score in question is the area deprivation index. So the area in, uh, deprivation index uh, has uh, 17 measures out of uh, uh, census data. And uh, it, the way CMS is planning to use it is at the zip code level, which we tested here. We're also were interested in specific diagnosis and most interested in heart failure and AMI uh, in, in this study. And uh, also what, what we were uh, looking at here as well is we have several hospitals in the system and quite different readmission rates and clearly uh, different Medicaid uh, proportion Medicaid in these hospitals. So we were studying this by hospital as well uh, to, to make sure that it's uh, informative. So this is uh, the key findings. Using um, a very similar model to a stepwise uh, selection model for prediction, we use the purposeful selection method uh, we ended up throwing out the area deprivation index. Big surprise, really didn't like it, but that's what happens to researchers. Uh, so area deprivation index uh, was not very helpful. Uh, and uh, on top of that, we had a very uh, surprising result where uh, at the zip code level, above median unemployment rate, will decrease the odds of readmissions. So again, something that to look into further. So really the, the conclusion around the ADI, the area deprivation index and, and, and socioeconomic factors for us was maybe zip code's not a good idea. Uh, when, when you go and visit uh, Lankenau, one of their hospitals, Lankenau is right there on that street where you go from a very shady neighborhood where you're uncomfortable even driving through. Then there is Lankenau, so very poor neighborhood. And as soon as you pass Lankenau, the first um, uh, um, Whole Foods store shows up. So, uh, so zip code's not really, and they're in the same zip code, obviously. Um, so zip code maybe is not uh, the level of analysis we need for social, uh, social determinants. And uh, in our future study, we're looking now at census block. So hopefully we'll get a little bit more insightful ideas. But what we did find is that um, what, what uh, is the uh, biggest predictor of a readmission uh, are older men on Medicaid um, uh, with a discharge status for skilled nursing facilities, severity uh, of illness high, and COPD. So, so we joke about this where we told them, you know, you need to focus on your older male, poor, uh, you know, Medicaid, uh, older uh, smoking men, right? So, so that's basically what we uh, came out of this study. Um, and uh, what we're doing this year with this is uh, focusing, we actually uh, right now have one of our human factors engineers uh, at Lankenau, uh, looking at this population, the older smoking male, uh, Medicaid patient, and what happens when they come through the ED and how decisions are made about admission versus non-admission, because really what we're focusing on is avoiding admission uh, with, with, with this one. I think that was the biggest insight here, is we need to focus on that population and try to avoid admissions. So the future direction we're taking is 
we're really interested in those in that whole category of collaboration. Uh, so we want to know more about collaboration and really understand what type of hospital community collaborations uh, work and which ones really work to, to reduce uh, the disparity gap. Um, because we see more Medicaid patients uh, being readmitted and we see more hospitals with Medicaid patients collaborating more. So we need to really know which one of these work because that's a lot of resources that go into co uh, collaboration. So these are our next specific aims that have to do uh, with identifying, really what we like to do is identify the bundle of hospital community uh, collaboration strategies that work, work to reduce readmissions. And so the preliminary findings, as you can see uh, from a national sample, uh, of hospitals is the more Medicaid days, uh, the higher your readmissions. Uh, it really affects a heart failure quite a bit. Um, and, uh, and then what we have here, proportion Medicaid and hospital collaborations, the more Medicaid, the more they report that they're collaborating. We have now a unique data set that's a national survey. It's a uh, American Hospital Association survey that asks specifically about nine types of collaboration or collaboration with nine types of community organizations. So it gives us a starting point to, to look at collaboration and then take a deeper dive into that. Uh, at this point, I was going to check with you and see if we want to still continue on and totally go into the construction site of structure. Okay, so yes. I have not studied, yes, I will repeat the question. So the question is, uh, do we have any insight on the effectiveness of a robocall, which is usually done first uh, before the patient is called by a human being? Uh, so we have not studied that yet, so I, can, I cannot speak to that. Uh, we have studied um, readmission, uh, uh, phone calls, uh, post-discharge phone calls, and compared effectiveness of post-discharge uh, post phone calls when they're at the department level versus centralized. And uh, what we found there uh, is that when you're doing phone calls centralized, there is a higher odds of reaching the patient. So it was a two-step. Right, so, so it's a higher odds of reaching the patient, which then uh, reduces readmissions if you actually you know, uh, have that phone call. So um, it, it might be something similar to that. Maybe there is a higher odds of reaching the patient. Uh, I'm not sure. Good, good, good study. So, um, so here, this is where we are uh, really, this is my, my work over the last, 10 years, I would say, where we're really focusing on, on um, the uh, uh, construction site of structure. How do we develop uh, this, uh, this area? Uh, how do we develop an organization that brings about a great patient experience as uh, measured in patient uh, experience uh, scores? And so what we have found here is um, there is a lot of marketing and culture theory and literature, uh, it doesn't often apply to healthcare, and uh, so we were focusing on both theory and practice. Uh, but current literature, is it's, it's even harder to really extract real science out of it because there is a lot of anecdotal evidence and case reports on this, ex uh, on this topic, uh, and really little established theory. So what we, what we thought we would do is establish theory. Right, establish theory around the patient experience. And this is, this is uh, what we came up uh, uh, with. And this is a paper that will be published in, it's forthcoming, will be published in uh, Health Marketing Quarterly um, this year. Uh, we come up with um, a framework for action for, for a great patient experience that relies on marketing and management theory, but also informed by practice by looking at models of practice. Um, and uh, 
we, we understand that patient experience is linked to organizational culture, clearly, uh, in not just healthcare, in everything, but we also acknowledge that you can't fix culture. So we really needed to figure out what are the lev levers that we use in order to influence culture towards a great patient experience. And, and the results out of the study gave us the four lever, levers, basically. You work with physicians, partners, places, and processes. And so uh, quickly to let you know that this is real, somewhat real research, it's, yes, it's snowboarding, but we did look at a uh, theory of uh, service clues that has been uh, uh, quite um, uh, established in healthcare through Dr. Uh, Len Berry, he's act actually at a and studied uh, the Mayo Clinic for years. Uh, we um, also included uh, the patient perception versus staff action model uh, here, and this has to do with how you manage patient expectations to get your great satisfaction scores. You inform the patient about how long it's going to take, you get better scores. Um, and then the whole theory around patient satisfaction and how we measure it. And also the, the challenges of these sat, uh, satisfaction uh, surveys. So looking into that and our work on how do you develop those cultural elements to achieve the uh, six IOM uh, aims. That's a publication from about 10 years ago, uh, but uh, built on that as well. Uh, and the whole area of uh, compassion and empathy, right? There was a lot on compassion and empathy that was uh, included. Next, this was theory on the practice side. Uh, we um, included all the elements that went into uh, the patient experience strategies at uh, Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, and the two uh, top non-healthcare uh, models that are applied to healthcare now, which is Disney and Ritz-Carlton. So we mapped what we have from theory and from practice, and uh, we mapped them uh, based on each one of these themes. So it's quite um, related to uh, inductive uh, content analysis in order to build theory. And once we do that, this is just an example of these measles charts, and we map them. Uh, models of practice are mapped. We then result in these four Ps. And, and really, what we offer here is clear direction and strategy towards how to move these uh, levers. So with physicians, uh, they need ad adequate training and management tools patient satisfaction tools and pay, uh, payment models. Number one was really giving them the autonomy to manage patients and their quality of life was important because they're the first contact uh, for the patient and the most important relationship. We called everybody else in the team partners and with partners that's where you need training on uh, customer service, uh, empathy and uh, emotional resiliency, also access to mentors which is um, usually the physician. And with, uh, with places, uh, it was most important to connect people uh, and patients in the appropriate places. So really taking the triage model uh, and applying it to before the patient shows up at your door uh, in order to come up with the appropriate places. And then finally, processes having to do with uh, manufacturing science, really, uh, engineering the uh, medicine and uh, making sure that the patient is part of that production, production cycle. I have specific uh, slides on these, but I, I don't think I'm going to go through that because I want to open it, up, open it up for discussion and then we can maybe move to one of those slides. Okay, thank you. A um, little controversial. I'm sure there's a lot of physicians sitting there. We know how to do this. Why we, why we need somebody to come in and tell us how to reorchestrate the whole thing. Uh, first of all, any questions from the floor? Uh, so I'll kick it off. Is that um, we live in a bunch of different cost buckets. I actually kind of reminded me of, of your last slide. We had Ritz Carlton, Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, they own the process top to bottom. They don't basically farm out anything to anybody. Uh, we're not like that. We're divided up in a bunch of different groups. Are we making a mistake or is it a lot easier to control if you own the entire process? It is, it is much easier when you own the entire process. Yes. 
So this is much more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so for example, the, the telephone calls. Um, again, I always say that I can have a, a great nurse who's the face of our practice, who does a tremendous job with the patients, the patients are going to be happy. I can have another nurse who doesn't represent it that well, and the patient will be very unhappy. There's still an FTE, there's still a phone call, but it all comes down to the quality of the people who are doing those kind of interactions. And it seems like that would, that's one of the missing elements is, you know, a phone call is a phone call is a phone call, I think, in your model, whereas the quality of that phone call and the quality of these people and my world seems to be incredibly important about patient satisfaction. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think um, uh, really t uh, today uh, what, what, what I presented was a typical um, secondary data analysis approach to health services research. And, and uh, I, I didn't include the fact that once we find patterns, we're most interested in taking a deep dive. And those... Um, uh, microsystems, what we call those, those small clinical teams, were much, much interested in understanding how variations happen in effectiveness uh, based on team differences. So then we go into the observational studies and really understand what are those uh, clinical teams and those uh, the characteristics of the nurses that call uh, that um, give you the great products. It takes observational research. It's more of a um, uh, systems approach. Uh, we often have uh, human factors engineers uh, involved with that. And, and the other aspect of all that is, is just the, the human technology interaction that comes into play as well. So that's a big area for us uh, of interest. Get Dr. Park heads up the heart failure program. They're always on the pointy end of readmissions because it's such a huge part of what we do. Dr. Park. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your data with us. It's um, in, in all the way comforting to know that this is a challenge for everybody in, in healthcare in our country. Uh, just uh, So we all recognize that education is a big part of preventing readmission and helping patients do better long time. And patient, uh, the medication errors is a huge source of the education process. Um, we, we have a dedicated clinic where we bring patients in to do just that, and we find that over 75% of the patients do have medication errors. But given that, um, what we are also finding is that we, we're challenged with the patient um, acknowledged burden of information. I mean, they're so overloaded with information that we, um, you know, everybody from the nurses to physicians, you know, we, we try to educate the patients, but it just it's not filtering through. Um, in your studies, have you found a more effective way to get that information through to them? Mm -hmm. uh, sure, that's a, that's a great uh, uh, question. It's and it look it, good thing that educate education uh, shows up as one of the top strategies, right? So it it works. So what we have found um, over the years in uh, putting together teams uh, that include patient education is um, first of all uh, at the eight, uh, eighth grade level is the communication it's, is most uh, effective. There's actually an IOM report on health literacy uh, that is very helpful. And then uh, the teams that work well, we, we work really well, especially on the School of Public Health side in um, uh, developing teams that include community health workers. We have found community health workers, so lay health workers that live in the communities with the patients um, are most uh, effective in um, both uh, uh, health education, uh, prevention, screening, early detection, uh, as well as readmissions. So I would encourage you to look, in, look into, that, into that model of the community health worker. Yeah, before before uh, Michael's question, let me just follow up on that. One of the more memorable grand rounds was from a heart failure researcher at Cleveland Clinic who was working on readmissions. And he was all into telemetry and devices, and he said none of it worked. And then he said, what they did was test the patients and they gave them five words. They needed to interview them. And they could, and they asked them to repeat the five words. And the level of understanding and being able to reproduce those words was shocking. Then he gave them, said, draw a clock face and, and draw the, the hands in at 10 minutes to two. And 30, 40% of people couldn't do it. And, the, and his point was that that was the single most important piece of information is understanding the functional level of the patient. And if they can't understand it, it doesn't matter how much education you gave them, you had to find somebody else in the family who was going to take ownership from that. So, Michael. 
Uh, quick question. So I appreciate the information you shared on patient experience and particularly this slide. But going back to Rich Carlin Disney, do you believe or think hospitals should adopt an onstage and offstage type of approach to patient satisfaction, knowing that at least all of us in this room and on this campus tend to always be on stage? Uh, yes, I do. I, if I can express my personal, <laughs> personal um, opinion about this, I think offstage is necessary not uh, only um, based on because of HIPAA requirements, uh, the necessity to communicate uh, still. Not, not all communication is most effective when it's uh, done through the EHR. Most effective care coordination happens uh, in hallway conversations or when you pick up a call, a phone. Um, and also it's important to have that offstage environment to just be able to relax, take a breath. Uh, and I, I believe offstage uh, helps with burnout, honestly. Any other questions? So you had these two indices, the LACE index and the hospital index. Are you using it clearly to identify the patient at risk of readmission? Are you then suggesting that those are the ones that you target more resources on? Because right now it's this kind of blanket across the board. We apply the same matrices to the, all patients. And so is that the next step in, in using these matrices? Yes. Uh, absolutely. I think uh, uh, strategies across the board are not effective and sustainable. Uh, so uh, really, you, you want to focus on high-risk populations and make sure that your risk calculator uh, is most effective for your setting. So basically, the message out of that is these risk calculators are great, but maybe for your patients, you need to look at a, another risk calculator to identify your risk groups and and focus uh, interventions on that group. All right, well, thank you very much. Now, if people want to get in touch with you, to work with you, how do they do that? What's the best way of doing it? Uh, shoot me an email. Email. So, yeah. And the method, you have Methodist email? Methodist email? All right. Thank you very much indeed for presenting today. <laughs>